Hello BookTube. This is a bit of a mashup of a video. I'm going to talk about um, books I've read this week, um, a book haul, and then uh, maybe some ideas going forward with the channel. So um, to start off with, I always keep a commonplace book. I've had these for years. I've got lists of everything I've read full length book wise since uh, 1991, um, which by then I was already in my 30s. I wish I'd kept them before then. So, uh, But this uh, last um, week I read Foot, uh, Footsteps, um, Adventures of a Romantic Biographer by Richard Holmes. Really, really liked it, um, especially the section on Nerval. And, and, and I enjoyed the part on Robert Louis Stevenson. And uh, right before that, I had read his other book, The Long Pursuit, Reflections of a Romantic Biographer, again, uh, Richard Holmes, and, right, and and loved it. And then at the library where I work, I, on my desk, I have the new one, which I think is called Sidetrack, so I haven't started yet. So I'll be reading that coming up here real quick. Um, I get all three, I've gotten those three through the library. Um, actually, if I found nice copies of those, I think I enjoyed them so much, I'd actually buy them for the for the home library here. And then um, I finished up, this is a omnibus volume, uh, The Layden Universe. Hope you can see it without too much glare. Big old thing here. This is um, Sharon Lee and Steve Miller, um, The Leiden Universe novels. This has an introduction by Anne McCaffrey. And it's uh, Michael Herring is the publisher. Right on there, so you can see it. Um, so I finished the first novel, which is a conflict of conflict of honors. There's no A in front of it, and really, really liked it. Um, I'll continue on. This will be the second novel, and then there's the third one. I liked it. I like the pace. It's really fast pace. Um, I like the world building. Uh, the humans are sort of not the top of the heap and the Leiden, which seem awful human to me, are um, a bit of a romance. Some magic elements, which sort of threw me because it's sort of a space opera. But in the end, I bought into it and I thought it was really good. Uh, Priscilla, the main character, I, she, she's fantastic. And then Shan, the captain, and the, the villain was good. Um, I thought sort of weakened in the end a little bit, but still I enjoyed it. So I will continue on with these. This, uh, these two writers live up in Maine, and uh, yeah, I, 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 I enjoyed it very much. Um, so I'll be reading that, and then um, I, I went out today a little bit. I took part of the day off, just needed a bit of a break. And I went to Listen, which is a thrift store, and I went to Queechee, which is... It's like an antique mall type place. Didn't really, I didn't buy anything there, but at least I bought a few. So I spent about six bucks on all these combined. Um, I found some good stuff. Um, to start off with, this is Susan Cheever, uh, Home Before Dark, a biographical memoir of John Cheever by his daughter. But it's, it is a, true that that, that that makes sense, but it's a family memoir, really. Um, this is, uh, I always think of him as the great short story writer, right? Um, let me see here. Houghton Mifflin Company, Boston. And this is, looks like a first edition from 1984. It's in really good shape. Uh, fascinating family story. I'm, look, I'm looking forward to it. She's become quite a writer in her own right. Uh, see if we... There she is right there. And, uh, yeah, I like these sort of things. Depending on who it's about, obviously. So I'll give it a read. I've seen it around forever. I mean, there's, there's nothing unusual about this book. I, I made a ton of copies, so, um, but I finally get around to reading it. I need to find his collected short stories, John Cheever's. He had a big, I think it was red color, big giant. Yeah, I'd love to have that. The second one is by Deborah Davis, and it's called Strapless. John Singer Sargent and the Fall of Madam X. 
Another one I've seen around before and never picked up. Um, this is published by, let me see here, and I make it tricky for me. I think they want you to know. Oh, Tarcher Penguin. And this is from 2003. Now, let me read you a little bit. In the early 1880s, Parisian gossip columns were bursting with news of 23-year-old Virginia Emily Goutreau, I believe, whose stunning looks and unconventional behavior had made the city's hottest its girl, had made her the city's hottest its girl. The fame-hungry Goutreau soon met John Singer Sargent, an up-and-coming artist eager to collaborate on a portrait that would catapult both of them to the pinnacle of society. Sargent's painting of Goutreau was shown in the 1884 Paris Salon, but while Sargent, the American son of vagabond parents, rose to lasting stardom, Goutreau, cultivated since childhood to be admired and envied, was ridiculed and then utterly forgotten. And this is the story of that painting. So, uh, I, I, it's a little bit of art history that might be... Uh, fun to dig into. So we'll see how it goes. Then I get, I've read a lot of Robert Graves. Greek myths, um, the Claudius novels, um, his autobiography, which is wonderful. Was it goodbye to all that? Um, and then here's his Homer's daughter. I found it in this old Hey, rags. I have a little bit of a crease here. I'm hoping it will hold up to reading. This is Academy Chicago. When, when did they publish it? When did he publish it? 1955 by Robert Graves, and then the Academy Chicago edition is 1982. Um, Homer's Daughter. Robert Graves has repeated another, oh, recreated, excuse me, another strong and convincing historical setting. This time the scene of the Odyssey, which he believes occurred in western Sicily. He based this belief on arguments made by Samuel Butler, the author of Erewhon and the Way of All Flesh, who believed also that the author of the Odyssey was not the blind and bearded Homer of legend, but the young woman who calls herself Nausicaa in the story. Graves reads Butler's argument, read Butler's arguments while he's doing research for a dictionary of Greek myths became convinced that they were irrefutable and could not rest, he says, until he had written this novel. Here, he says, is the story of a high-spirited and religious-minded Sicilian girl who saves her father's throne from usurpation, herself um, from a distasteful marriage, and her two younger brothers from butchery by boldly making things happen instead of sitting still and hoping for the best. Sounds good. Give it a shot. I usually like graves. Then this next one, um, I had to grab. I just got done last month with a buddy read with a bunch of really good uh, book tutors and uh, book blogger um, of China Mieville's Perdido Street Station, which still is working on me. It's, it's been a couple of weeks. It's, it's that kind of book. I'm thrilled I read it, and I read it in such good company. All of them, what they were. So... Um, I saw this, I don't know anything about it, and this is China Mieville, The City in the City. And there's no way I couldn't pick it up because it, it just fascinates me. A little, uh, a little blurb here says, if Philip K. Dick and Raymond Chandler's love child were raised by Franz Kafka, the writing that emerged might resemble The City in the City, okay? Um, Let's see, it says winner of the World Fantasy Award, the, uh, the Arthur C. Clarke Award, and the Hugo Award for Best Novel. And named one of the best books of the year by Los Angeles Times, Seattle Times, and Publishers Weekly. Okay, when a murdered woman is found in the city of Bezel, somewhere at the edge of Europe, it looks to be a routine case for Inspector Theodore Borloo of the Extreme Crime Squad. To investigate, Borloo must travel from the decaying Bessel to its equal, rival, and intimate neighbor, the vibrant city of Ulcoma. Does that mean the, the coma? I don't know. But this is a border crossing like no other, a journey 
as psychic as it is physical, a seeing of the unseen. With UI Coleman uh, Detective Quissom Dot Borlu, uh, Quissom Dot, Borlu is enmeshed in an assorted underworld of nationalists intent on destroying their neighbor, neighboring city and unificationists who dream of dissolving the two into one. As the detectives uncover the dead woman's secret, they begin to suspect a truth that could cost them more than their lives. What stands against them are murderous powers in Bezo and Ukoma, and a most terrifying of all, that which lies between the two cities. So no on China Mieville, <laughs> this is gonna be a trip. So we'll, we'll give it a shot. Then, um, thrilled to find this. This is Absence of Mind by Marilyn Robinson. And you will know her. So old Borders sticker here. Um, in this ambitious book, acclaimed writer Marilyn Robinson applies her astute intellect to some of the most vexing tomics, uh, topics in the history of human thought, science, religious, religion, and consciousness. Crafted with the same care and insight as her award-winning novels, Absence of Mind challenges postmodern atheists who crusade against uh, religion under the banner of science. In Robinson's view, scientific reasoning does not denote a sense of logical infallibility, as thinkers like Richard Dawkins might suggest. Instead, in its purest form, science represents a search for answers. It engages the problem of knowledge, an aspect of the mystery of consciousness, rather than providing a simple and final model of reality. Okay, so we'll see. Uh, these are from the Terry Lectures. It says there. Um, I'm going to give a whole list. I'll just put it up here in case you want to freeze your screen to see who else has been in these lectures. Um, let's see. Uh, Paul Record, Freud and Philosophy, which I think I've read actually. Jacques Maritain, John Dewey, Eric Frome, Paul Tillich, The Courage of Me, I've read that. Oh uh, boy. Some serious folks have been in this series. Wow, okay. Yale University Press, and this is. Um, the first edition from 2010. So I'll, I'll be interested in this. It's a nice little volume. So we'll, we will see. And then I was thrilled to find this next book. Absolutely thrilled. I'm a big fan of mystery and of masterpiece theater. Love them. I think I started with... Um, I would have been I. Claudius to get back to Robert Graves, right? I think I. Claudius with Sir Derek Jacobi and all them, and back when I was a youngster. Um, so many, so many different, different shows I've watched. Um, love the um, and mystery also. Um, of course, I loved uh, the, um, the intro and all that stuff, but um, yeah. Jeremy Brett and Sherlock Holmes was one of my favorite. So, and that was Granada Television, but I saw it on this week. So this is the book. This is Rebecca Eaton, ex executive producer of Masterpiece. Making Masterpiece, 25 years behind the scenes at Masterpiece Theater and Mystery on PBS. Could not let this go by. No, oh, what a place to be, huh? And this is Viking. And this is... Uh, also a first edition and it came out in 2013 and I picked it up I was still to find it um, let me see did you stop answering the phone at 9 p.m. on Saturday nights to watch the original upstairs downstairs did you gather at the water cooler or its electronic equivalent to discuss last night tra uh, tragic events on Downton Abbey did you treat your sister with delight and amazement when Sherlock jumped off the roof, splattered himself on the sidewalk, and then showed up behind a tree at his own gravesite? As Rebecca Eaton, executive producer of the longest-running primetime television drama in American history, says in her candid and witty memoir, Masterpiece seems to connect people across generations and up and down family trees. 
the show's longevity, 42 years, has to do with the company we keep when we watch it. So when the young Vassar graduate suddenly became the producer of Masterpiece Theater in 1985, she hadn't actually seen many of the episodes, nor did she like mystery novels, though her new job required her to choose British detective stories for the popular offshoot, Mystery. A lifelong Anglophile who apprenticed at the BBC World Service, she saw an opportunity for an idealistic young woman to make her mark in a new, newly established public television system. 28 years later, Masterpiece is one of the hottest shows on televisions, uh, from the crinolines of Cranford to the cybernetics of Sherlock. So, yeah, it's just so much fun to look at these pictures. Uh, we got one with Robert Redford and Tony Hillerman and, and the author of when they were doing Skinwalkers. Right there. We've got, um, let's see. I mean, you see that 20th anniversary image there. Oh, here's one I really like. This is a picture that's got Men of Mystery. Jeremy Brett, Sherlock Holmes. John Thaw, who played Inspector Morris. I love the Inspector Morris series. You got the author. You got Peter Davison, who played Lord Campion. And David Suchet, who uh, played Her Hercule Perrault. Right in the middle there, black and white. So, um, and then they have pictures here with uh, her with Alistair Cook. I think, where is that at? Yeah, right here. Who's who, who I remember starting watching the show with. Um, we have a, a lady in town, um, a British lady, who uh, worked for the BBC. She worked in uh, France, but she also worked in New York. And she tells me stories about Alistair Cook. She tells me stories about Kenneth Clark, who did uh, Civilization, one of the first great television documentaries. Um, and, and she tells me inside scoop stuff and I could I could listen to her all day long. She's fascinating. Knows everybody. So uh, that's pretty good little haul there. Um, yeah, hold it up and do one of those Steve Donahue pyramid things. So I'm um, currently, um, I'm probably going to read the second novel in this. And what's the name of that? That one's Agent of Change. Um, I'm continuing on with uh, my reading of Every Tool's a Hammer, Life is What You Make It by Adam Savage, which I'm really enjoying. It's about creativity. It's, it's really nice. And I'm probably going to try to get into this a little, little teeny thing. Rudyard Kipling's Vermont Feud by uh, Frederick F. Vanderwater. Um, so I have a little bit of reading to do this weekend. I don't think I'm going to be able to resist this. It just sounds fascinating to me. So I hope everyone's doing well. This ran a little long. I apologize. But I hope you have a good weekend. And thank you, BookTube.